Hello, and thank you for joining us for the first episode in Chris 180's new Candid Conversation series. I'm Chandra Luckett, Chief Marketing Officer, and your host today. And I am really pleased that you all have decided to spend a little time with Chris 180 to talk about a very serious subject, suicide. Did you know that September is National Suicide Prevention Awareness Month? Suicide is the 12th leading cause of death in this country, and it's a taboo subject that many people don't want to talk about. It leaves broken relationships, broken families, and people asking themselves every day, what could I have done to help? Well, today we have two experts here who are going to shed a little bit of light on the stigma surrounding suicide and how we can all do our parts to help save lives. I am pleased to introduce my colleagues, Meg Rudolph, who is a clinical director here at Chris 180, and Shakira Jones, who is a clinical supervisor here at Chris 180. Ladies, take it away. Thank you so much, Chandra. Yes, I'm Meg Rudolph. I'm the clinical director for our Fulton County Behavioral Health Program. And I'm Shakira Jones. I'm a clinical supervisor at our Atlanta office. Um, so Meg, I think we could probably start with what is some of the stigma associated with suicide? You know, I think both of us have been in this field for some years now. And one thing that always continues to shock me is how much even just the word suicide is so hard for people to say. And you even almost hear it whispered. It, your, the octave goes down when people talk about it. And even us as clinicians, we still have a difficult time talking about it. And I think it's it's one of those topics that is so traumatic to speak about. It's it's so sad to speak about. I mean, we can be honest about that. And it's so hard to speak about that we shy away from it. And like Chandra just said, it's the 12th leading cause of death. I mean, it's that's really common. Yeah. 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 I think there's a lot of shame associated with it, which is why the whispers happen. And even in saying something like commit suicide, you commit crimes, you know, right. you die by right. suicide. And I think it's it's something that's very, very scary, the notion of like not wanting to be alive or not being here anymore um, that kind of leads people to to, to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You bring up a really good point, too, is how we the language that we use associated with suicide. We really frowned upon actually using something like talking about somebody commit committed suicide. It's now they have died by suicide. I think that's one thing for viewers to really be aware of is that we need to switch our language up. You are so right in that. We hear commit. Mm -hmm. Commit often can be associated with very negative things. And that's why we need to be just very careful about how we speak about it. Um, and there's so many different factors that go along with suicide and the shame that you bring up as well. And also there's so many cultural factors. There's religious factors. There's so many different pieces that then create that shame. Um and I'm curious as to like what your perspective is as far as like those cultural pieces and all the things that surround a human and what would make them sh ashamed. Yeah, I think that I, what I would like is for people to change their narrative of it in that it's uh, some sort of like weakness mm -hmm. to to contemplate that or to to act out mm -hmm. um, suicidal ideation. In that oftentimes people don't want to die. They want to end the pain and the suffering that they're experiencing. And they don't feel like there is any other option besides that. I think it's really important for people to kind of lean in and support people versus, you know, making them isolated. Because that's what depression does. It makes you want to be alone. It the voices, the thoughts that you're having is like, I deserve to be alone. I need to, I'm a burden to people. Right. Um, I think that that's part of it that that adds to the shame that they feel. Right. And when you're in that state, the hardest thing that you can do in that moment is to ask for help. It's not easy to pick up the phone. It's not easy to call a crisis line. You won't think, oh, I'm just going to call a crisis line or, you know, I'm going to call 911. That's probably the farthest thing from somebody's mind. It's even difficult to be like, okay, well, I'm just going to send a text to one of my friends and let them know that I'm suffering or that I need help or that maybe I just need them to come over. In that moment, you feel you're so deep in that loneliness. You're so deep in that isolation. And those simple actions that, you know, maybe somebody that is functioning, you know, in not that state of mind can simply be like, you know, 
hey, you want to do something, you want to hang out, you want to go out to dinner, that's not going to be an easy task for somebody that's actively experiencing suicidal ideation. Um, now, I think one big thing, too, is just how much mental health is now talked about in social media, on TV. I mean, you turn on a Netflix show and it's all over the place. I've even seen, I was reading some articles that they've had to remove specific scenes from TV shows because they were so graphic. Um, do you feel that the amount that it is being discussed now on social media, on, you know, just on TV and movies, like how do you feel that's impacted the conversation of suicide? Yeah, I think that people feel more comfortable, like, and they're more aware, like, of these are things that people are dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, suicidal ideation, like we said, is very isolating, and so knowing that other people are experiencing these things mm -hmm. makes you aware of how common they are. Suicidal ideation is very, very, very common, mm -hmm. but I don't think people realize that. Right. Um, and I think that it adds to the sort of cultural conversation that we're having. Mm -hmm. I think, to go back to what you're saying about like culture, I think that our society is one that is, it values independence and that you should right. be doing things on your own. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that lends to the shame. Mm -hmm. I think if we sort of help people realize that like, you don't have to do this by yourself and creating community and having conversations about things that are kind of scary and kind of uncomfortable mm -hmm. with your tribe mm -hmm. of people, you really, really help and it's really beneficial. Right. And I think the more you have those conversations, the more you learn that people have experienced very similar experiences. Yeah. Everybody has a story. And I think that's one beautiful thing to mention is that every single person has a story. Everybody has a history. Everybody has experiences. Everybody has traumas. And the more we talk about it, the more you actually learn that somebody may have experienced a very similar story. Um, a lot of clinicians go into the field because they have their own stories. We all have our own stories. And I think one thing that people don't recognize is, you know, we all have so much passion to go into this field and we may have had it you know, our own personal journey with depression, with suicidal ideation, knowing somebody that may have, you know, died by suicide. And it's just, it's such a topic that we need to talk about more. Yeah. It's so important. Yeah. So, you know, a question for both of you, what if people suspect someone in their lives are considering suicide? What are the steps that they should take? You know, is it a conversation with them? Is it trying to assess where they are? What should they do? It's a really good question. I think there is, you can do something as small as just showing that you care about somebody. Like even just taking somebody out to dinner, taking somebody out to coffee, just going over to their home. Something as simple as just telling them that you care about them. I think there's such a fear that if you bring up the word, that it's going to make it more likely that they're going to act on it. It's not the case. And it could be a simple act of kindness that can completely shift the mindset for somebody. Um, I don't think it needs, it doesn't need to be as significant as, okay, well, we're taking you in the car, we're doing this, this, and this now. If you feel like somebody's at risk, you can start slow. You can start baby steps. I think it's important for people to have education or crisis resources, but it's amazing how little just showing that you care and love somebody can make an impact. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, when I was in graduate school, like learning about suicidal ideation, I had no concept of how to address it. Mm -hmm. And I was one of those people that was like, we can't ask that because then they'll think about it and they'll right. do it. Yes. When it's actually the opposite, you mm -hmm. should ask very directly. Mm -hmm. Like, are, it, it feels like something is off with you. Are you consider like are you feeling like you don't want to be alive? Mm -hmm. That's the vibe that I'm getting. Yeah. Um, like how are you feeling? Mm -hmm. Are you considering these things? And like mm -hmm. even saying it, it kind of pulls back sort of the curtain and the scariness of it. Mm -hmm. Um, that I would say is absolutely what you should do. And knowing the the resources that are available to you. Absolutely. Um, so I'm wondering about um, like COVID and the mm -hmm. impact <laughs> that it's had on people's mental health and mm -hmm. their, the, the rates of suicide. 
right? COVID has done a number in our society and on men in mental health. Um, we have seen a drastic increase in the amount of people that are seeking services. And while that's great, we're also able to recognize the drastic impacts that COVID had on mental health and, and suicide. Um, COVID was isolating. COVID basically created this isolating environment where we couldn't be around our support systems, our loved ones, the things that we did for joy and happiness that got us out of our homes were taken away from us in a snap. That is huge, especially for somebody who might have already been experiencing some of these thoughts to then go from having that social connectedness and having those things that bring them joy to then it being ripped away from them for not just like the years, years. Yeah, I think that like what happened with COVID was like all of the risk factors that we learned about. Yes. Like suicidal ideation, yes. the social isolation, changes to your job, your, your employment, yes. your social interactions, like all of these things that are like protective factors mm -hmm. were suddenly like ripped away from people mm -hmm. and we were expected to just adjust adjust and figure it out <laughs> right um which you know is, is unrealistic mm -hmm. like of course there are going to be re repercussions for that right. and i think that you know people have been reaching out and trying to seek services because they or, and also you had time to sit in your house and not just you had no distractions from the side of the dust bunnies in your right. brain right right you're yeah. like oh you are alone literally alone with your thoughts completely alone with your thoughts and that proved to be quite dangerous. And when, and even the, the lack of in-person resources, everything went virtual. Yeah. You know, even for clinicians, all of a sudden we were seeing clients in person in our offices and then, nope, you're now home and you need to learn how to see clients virtually. That was way harder for her clients to adjust to. Um, and some don't do well with that virtual aspect. They really like that one one on one in person piece. And that was lost. And we really learned how how important it is to have that human contact. There's only so much that I mean, there's so many wonderful virtual platforms. Do not get me wrong. But we have learned how beautiful it is just to be able to give somebody a hug and just to like see you in person. Like this was something that you and I wouldn't have been able to do. A couple of years ago, you and I would have been on a computer screen. Yeah, I think also for the clients that you know you were seeing, you already had the the connection. You knew kind yeah. of what was going on. But mm -hmm. for the people that you meet initially virtually, mm -hmm. it's such a learning curve. It is, um, and I think one thing that I, I definitely want people to kind of take away is to like offer offer yourself grace. Like we went through mm -hmm. two three years of just like very, very tough circumstances. Yeah. It is absolutely normal to feel, you know, changes in your mental health and, you know, some darker stuff is absolutely normal because what we went through was pretty scary and very sure. traumatic. Yeah. And I think that people's like response and their feelings associated with completely normal. Yeah. And I will say while COVID, I mean, the pandemic and traumatizing, I will say, I am grateful that it did allow for people to truly recognize what mental health is and decrease some of that stigma surrounding mental health. I think we have gotten a lot better with having these conversations. And I will say there has been an increase in having discussions about suicide prevention and awareness since you know the COVID pandemic. So that is one thing I could say I am grateful for. Good came from one it. good thing, yeah. one of the good things, yeah. So ladies, what would you say is the importance of community and connection for people who are uh, needing more support in this time period? How how can their families and loved ones support them? I would say finding your tribe. Like that's, I, I love saying that, like the people that are around you, you know, we say like it takes a village to raise a child. And what makes you think that when you become an adult, you just are out in the wild and on your own. No, it takes a village to create a human. Yeah. I think like leaning on one another, reaching out and supporting one another. People say all the time, like check on your strong friends. Yes. Yeah, do that, but also, you know, check on other people too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is recognizing that it's okay to need somebody else. 
we are so, it's so ingrained in us that we need to take care of ourselves. We need to be independent. We need to figure it out. And it is okay to be like, I need you right now. I need this from you. I need this support from you. And if somebody off, this is one thing I will say on a personal level that has really been a learning curve for me is just accepting the help. I've had friends say, just say yes, no. Just say yes. I know you need this. And I'm like, oh God, okay, yes, I'll take it. I will take it. And I'm always grateful for it in the end. But instead of fighting it, just take the love, take the support. And I love that you say try. I think, I mean, that's a new term for me. And I think that's just a beautiful way to put it. And also recognizing that we don't need a huge group. You could have a few close people that you know are your support system. Some family members, some friends, close colleagues. It could be one or two close people that you know you can lean on. It doesn't have to be this very, very large group of people for you to have that support and love that you need. Yeah. I think also, like, saying, like, we need help. Take the support. And you're like, ooh, ooh, <laughs> what? That's, See, we've learned in our yes, own way, too. So. Yes. And, um, and I think, especially for, like, clinicians, like, it is okay yeah. for you to need help. Yep. Like everybody needs a therapist, even your clinician. Therapy um, for the therapist, yes, you know? It's, <laughs> like, it's so important. I, I think that letting people know that like therapy is normal. Um, and that, you know, even if it's like you need a little check in here mm-hmm. and there, it's okay. If you have the resources available to you mm-hmm. in EAP or your insurance, or there are some clinicians that do sliding scales. Mm -hmm. The worst that you can get is a no, but you have to look for it and ask for it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one thing that families can do is like let people know that it's okay to to need support Mm -hmm. or that you're available. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the capacity, like point them in the direction of someone who does. I think that's really important. I could not agree more. So I would love for you two to talk about briefly, you know, for people who are watching this who may be wondering if they're having suicidal thoughts, what do those things look like? That's a great question. I think it can look very different person to person. I don't think this is not a black or white type of thing. And I think there's also different types of suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. You know, we have passive thoughts, we have active thoughts. I think when you notice in yourself, I think this is probably the biggest way that you could recognize it is when you notice yourself going to a much darker place um, to where you feel like there is no resources, there is nothing that can help. Um, I think that is a very large indicator for you that, you know, you are experiencing this level of risk. Um, You may, it may be more clear for some people, they may have the, the active thought of, I want to die. I have a plan. Um, but it may not be so clear for other people. And I think that's one thing to, to notice and to be mindful of is that it's not just a simple thing that just switches in your brain and you know. But I think one thing that's been you know very helpful and I've had this conversation with clients before is when you notice that you're, when your thoughts are just they're very different, they're shifting and it feels darker, it feels lonelier, it feels more isolative. Um, and at that moment, it's almost impossible to ask for help yeah i i ask about suicide all the time um because i do a lot of intakes Mm -hmm. um and i if i was to just ask somebody like oh have have you thought about suicide they might say no but then also ask me more specifically like okay well have you had thoughts of like just wanting to be asleep and not wake up yes suicidal ideation Mm -hmm. have you thought about death and dying right or your own sort of mortality Mm -hmm. that can be an indicator of like some, some needing some more support or some suicidal ideation. Mm-hmm. Um, as also like giving away things that are super important to you. Yes. Like collecting, um, like or planning for your death, like mm-hmm. collecting pills or you know, trying to acquire a gun, things like that mm-hmm. are all sort of like indicators of like this is risky. Like, yeah. This we this person might be unsafe. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think people knowing what it looks like is super important. For sure. And I love that you ask in just more regular human terms. You know, we hear the word in this field, suicidal ideation, but that isn't something that a lot of people understand what that means. So, you know, putting it in more simple language, I think is extremely important. I think that's also important too for family members that may have somebody that they're worried about or friends, putting it in that language as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think like approaching 
checking on your family members or ass assessing mm -hmm. um, in a more warm way, like a human. Um, yeah, just being a person. Really important. Yeah, because I think sometimes the language, especially if you do this all the time, it could feel robotic. Yes. Um, and you have to add the humanity to mm -hmm. it, something be approachable mm -hmm. in the way that you check and assess and make sure that this person is safe. And being mindful, too, of all of the stigma that is surrounding suicide and that people often think this is a bad, bad thing. So when you're talking about it, it may be more difficult for a client to be like, yes, I'm experiencing that because they think it's bad, which then you think punishment versus treatment. Yeah. Or they're afraid that you're going to like send them to the hospital right. immediately when it doesn't it doesn't have to look like that. Nope. And I, I, when I talk to people, I preface it by like, listen, I need you to be as honest as possible and it you know, it might seem very scary, but I don't want to have to do that. But it is my job to keep you safe. Right. And so, like, the more honest you are, it's the safer I can. Absolutely. So my final question to both of you would be, what would you say to the loved ones of someone who has taken their own life? You know, as they're left to deal with the pieces of that, what kind of encouragement would you leave for them today? I would say see your own support and to not internalize that grief as some a shortcoming of your own um is a really really important for people mm -hmm. um, it's so easy to for family members to place blame on themselves it's so easy to do the what could i have done what should i have done why didn't i do this why didn't i recognize this sign and that I mean, you could get lost in that hole. There are resources available for family members. And, you know, we're out here to help you. And there's never somebody that can be blamed. Yeah. And and even in, like, the asking why, there are questions that you may never know the answer to. Like, I think the thing to focus on more is, like, translating the, the relationship that you have with another person into your memory. Yes, and not to let the the circumstances of your death color what your relationship and your memory is like, because it is very easy for that to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow! Thank you both so much for being here today and for sharing your insight. As they both talked about, you are not alone. If you or someone you know is thinking about it, is having thoughts, or even attempting to try to take your own life please reach out for help. We are happy to help you here at Chris 180 to go through counseling and therapeutic services. But if you need immediate support, please use the new suicide hotline, which is 988. You can text that or you can go online and use a chat feature on the website. Again, that is 988. And you can also call the Georgia Crisis and Access Line, which I wrote down because I didn't want to get the number wrong. It's one 800 715-4225. That's 1-800-715-4225. And again, that number is 988 if you want to text or call from your mobile device. Again, the National Suicide Hotline is 988, and you can use that from any place around the country where you are. Thank you for being with us today for this really important conversation. Please share it with someone in your network or maybe with your entire network. It only takes one of us to help save a life.